Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce um, a visiting scholar to McLean Hospital, Dr. Saber Katz-Wise. Dr. Katz-Wise uh, is an assistant professor in adolescent young adult medicine at Boston Children's Hospital, in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and in social and behavioral sciences at the Harvard School of Public Health. She also co-directs the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Expression Research Group at Boston Children's and the School of Public Health. Her research investigates sexual orientation and gender identity development, sexual fluidity, health inequalities and inequities related to sexual orientation and gender identity in adolescents and young adults, and psychosocial functioning in families and transgender youth. She's currently working on an NIH-funded uh, community-based study to examine how the family environment affects the health and well-being of transgender youth and to develop an intervention to support families with, tra with transgender youth. In addition to research, she's involved with advocacy efforts at Boston Children's Hospital to improve the workplace climate and patient care for LGBTQ individuals including her role as co-chair for the um, Boston Children's Hospital Rainbow uh, Consortium on Sexual and Gender Diversity. She also serves on the Harvard Medical School LGBT Advisory Committee and is an HMS uh, Sexual and Gender Minority uh, Curriculum Development Fellow. She co-founded the Alliance of Gender Affirming Professionals, a group of professionals and trainees in the greater Boston area who work with transgender youth and families and she's going to speak with us today on transgender youth and families in transition, research findings and clinical implications. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Katzwise. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I gave a talk last Friday at the Harvard Medical School Sex, Gender, and Sexuality Conference, and there were 350 people in the room. So this feels like a really nice intimate group in comparison. So I'm very happy about that. Um, can everyone hear me okay at this volume? Yes? Okay. Great. So I have no um, conflicts of interest to disclose, although I do want to start off by saying that I am not a clinician myself. Um, how many people in the room are clinicians? Many of you. And how many people work with youth? OK, that's helpful to know. Um, so my background is in developmental psychology, so I, I am not a clinician. Um, I will talk about clinical implications today uh, from my experience working alongside clinicians and what I see as, as being important in the clinical space from my perspective as a researcher and my perspective as a person of the queer community who identifies with the queer community, who is a parent of a queer parent of a child. Um, but I really rely also on all of you to see what from this can you take and bring into your clinical, your clinical world, what sort of resonates with you. So I'm going to talk about today um, mental health of transgender youth, family support as a protective factor, impacts on the larger family system, and imp implications for clinical practice with transgender youth and families. So I want to start off with a brief thought exercise to kind of get us all thinking about the space of families. So take a moment to imagine a family who you've worked with recently. If you're not a clinician, if you're a researcher, a family that you maybe worked with in, the, in a research capacity, or you can think about your own family. Think for a minute about what are family relationships like in this family? How do family members support each other? What does that look like? And how might individual family members' mental health be related to their family relationships? All right, so kind of keep that, keep that family in the back of your mind as, as we're moving forward. So I'm going to start off by talking about mental health of transgender youth. I've been assured that people in this audience are familiar with the basics of transgender people in terms of terminology. Um, if any of you feel like that is not the case, <laughs> please feel free to raise your hand, and I'm happy to clarify terms along the way. 
A growing body of research has indicated that transgender youth have higher rates of a number of different mental health concerns and risk behaviors compared to their cisgender peers. This includes depression, anxiety, suicidality, self-harm, use of inpatient and outpatient mental health services, substance use, and risky behaviors, risky sexual behaviors specifically. One study that was done that's a chart review of uh, mental health of transgender versus cisgender youth from an urban community health center in Boston um, found that transgender youth were more likely, to cis more likely than cisgender youth to have a depression and anxiety diagnosis, to have suicidal ideation and attempt, as well as self-harm. And you can see for some of these numbers, it's quite high, so more than half of the transgender um, patients in the sample having a depression diagnosis, for example. So in the field that I work in, we often think about uh, using my gender minority stress theory to understand um, why mental health concerns and risk behaviors might be higher among transgender youth. And we can think about it specifically today as manifesting in discrimination in school and a lack of family support. <coughs> So to walk through briefly, what, what is gender minority stress? Um, gender minority stress comes from minority stress theory, which proposes that distal stressors, such as experiences of prejudice and discrimination that are external to a person, and proximal stressors, or the internalization of stigma, <coughs> adversely affect both physical and mental health, in part via a psychological stress response. This theory was originally developed thinking about racial and ethnic minorities, but now it's since been adapted um, to sexual and gender minorities as well. So if we think about it specifically related to gender, the distal stressors would represent experiences of anti-transgender prejudice and discrimination, and the, inter the proximal stressors would represent internalized transphobia. Both of these would adversely affect mental and physical health. And because we can also take, it's also important to take an intersectional approach, we can think about how other social positions um, that might uh, confer experiences of racism, classism, homophobia, biphobia, all of, and on and on and on, and the internalized versions of those might also intersect with gender minority stress um, to produce negative outcomes. So what might this look like in the school setting? The GLSEN um, National School Climate Survey from 2015 reported that transgender youth had high numbers of negative school experiences, with 65% experiencing verbal harassment, 25% physical harassment, physical assault, 75% feeling unsafe at school, 70% avoiding bathrooms specifically, 56% avoiding locker rooms, and this is an, a national climate survey. So, um, the, the picture does not look super positive for transgender youth in the school system. And thinking about um, how gender minority stress might manifest in the family situation, um, these are results from the 2015 U.S. Trans Survey of Adults. Um, thinking about their family situations, 18% reported that they had an unsupportive family, 1 in 10 had experienced violence from a family member, 8% had been kicked out, and 10% had run away from home. So not necessarily a positive picture in the family setting either. So we know that family support is a really critical protective factor for everyone. This is not unique to transgender youth. So I showed these negative, this, this pretty negative data about family experiences among transgender adults. On the other hand, the same survey found that 60% of transgender adults reported having a supportive family. And another survey of transgender youth found that 64% feel safe at home. So obviously these numbers could be much higher, um, but there is a certain degree of support that transgender individuals are experiencing in their home settings. So how is family protective for transgender youth specifically? <laughs> Some of the research that has been done before has found that socially transitioned transgender children who are supported in their gender identities, who are affirmed in their identities, have normative levels of depression compared with the general population of children. 
Another study found that parental support is associated with higher life satisfaction, a lower perceived burden of being transgender, fewer depressive symptoms, and less suicidality among transgender adolescents specifically. And other research still has found that transgender youth with higher levels of family support and connectedness report better health. So we have some research that's starting to show us how family might be specifically protective for transgender youth. So this brings us to the first project that I'm going to talk about with you today, which is the Trans Teen and Family Narratives Project, um, which we call TTFN for short. The overall aim of this project is to investigate how the family context affects transgender youth's health and well-being over time and identify types of support needed for transgender youth and families. Um, this project is funded by a five-year Career Development Award from NICHD, um, which is ending in January and has been extended for a year. Um, so we're sort of at the, at the tail end piece of this project at this point. The TTFN sample includes 33 families, representing 96 family members. The, participant, the participating family members are 73 to 92% white, 40% of caregivers had a graduate degree. The transgender youth are adolescents, ages 13 to 17, um, and they represent a number of different transgender identities across the spectrum. The cisgender caregivers were primarily women, um, although we had some male caregivers as well, and the cisgender siblings represented both girls and boys. This project has taken a community-based participatory research approach, which involves the community in all steps of the research process, or as many steps as is feasible. This approach is particularly useful for marginalized populations because it helps to empower the community to be um, participants in the research that's being generated about them and to ensure that the research will have um, direct effects on the community, positive effects on the community and be useful for the community. The way that I approached community engagement in this project um, was to partner with community, specific community members, um, to use community advisory boards that were existing to review different aspects of the project and give me feedback as well as specific transgender youth and parent caregiver stakeholders, one of whom happens to be in this room. <laughs> in the first year of the project, I spent um, a year doing this community engagement process, which involved meeting with many, many people all over New England um, to get people's feedback on the project, to understand um, what are the important questions that we're asking? What measures should we be including? Um, how might this information that we are hoping to gather be useful for the community? So all these people have advised the project along the way. The design of this project is a longitudinal mixed method study with five waves of crossed two years. And you'll notice that we just finished collecting the data in March of this year, so a bit earlier this year. Um, we collected data every six months from these families, including qualitative interviews and surveys um, which e with each family member. Um, so just to reiterate, that's five waves of data times 96 people. <laughs> so that's a lot, of, a lot of data, particularly on the qualitative side. So I, we're, we're spending a lot of time kind of sifting through it at this point. Participants were recruited from organizations and clinics um, across New England that serve transgender youth and families. The primary research question that I'm going to talk about today from this data is looking at what is the mental health of transgender youth in this community-based um, sample and how is family functioning specifically associated with transgender youth's mental health. So to answer this question, um, we analyzed wave one quantitative survey data from all family members. And the trans youth um, reported their own mental health in a number of different outcomes. So in this sample, 30% of the trans youth um, reported having suicidal thoughts, 24% reported having a suicide plan, 15% had a suicide attempt, 49% engaged in self-harm, and 61% had a clinically significant depression score. 
This is pretty bleak, yes, for this sample. We were actually quite surprised at um, the, how high these numbers were, considering that this is a population that is participating with their family in a study, so they have to have some baseline level of, of family support here. We also asked the caregivers about mental health diagnoses for their child, and 17% of the caregivers reported that they had a child diagnosed with self-injury disorder, 40% had a child with a depression disorder, and 48% had a child with an anxiety disorder. So we also looked to see how was family functioning as reported on the survey by all, all family members related to the transgender youth's mental health. And we found that transgender youth who reported better family communication and higher satisfaction with their family had better mental health and higher self-esteem and resiliency. So it appears that, that family is, at, is having a protective role for this sample. Interestingly, um, we found that caregivers and siblings' reports of family functioning were not significantly related to transgender youth's um, own mental health. So th this tells us two things. One, um, that people have different perceptions of what's going on in the family in terms of family functioning. And two, that the transgender youth's own perception of family functioning appears to be the most relevant for their mental health. So to summarize um, some of these findings that I've, I've gone over, transgender youth in the sample have alarming rates of mental health concerns, and better family functioning from the transgender youth's perspective was associated with better mental health outcomes among the youth. So that's kind of what's happening on, on the level of the youth, but how might having a transgender youth in the family impact the larger family system? So the title of my talk was Families in Transition, right? So we want to think about not just what's happening with the transgender youth, but how might, might that kind of trickle across the whole family experience. So much of my work in this area is based on family systems theory integrated with ecological systems theory. Family systems theory proposes that family members are interdependent that individual family members' experiences must be considered within the functioning of the larger family system, that you can't really consider how one person's doing without thinking about what's going on in the rest of the family, and that a transition for one family member challenges the entire family system. Family systems theory was not originally developed with transgender people in mind, so transition in the original conceptualization of this theory might look like a divorce in the family. Um, someone is sick, someone gets a new job, the family moves. It can be any kind of transition. But I think this theory aligns quite nicely with transgender youth in thinking about gender transition specifically and how that might affect the family. <coughs> and we can also think about the family context within this larger ecologic system um, with the, the larger community context, the larger societal institutional context what's happening in the political environment that might be affecting these families, what's happening in their particular community based on where they live in a rural space, in a more urban space, do they have access to gender-affirming care or gender-affirming providers to see. So all of these things also affect from the outside what's happening um, in the family context, which then affects what's happening to individual family members. So this brings us to the second study that I want to talk to you about today, which is the Trans Youth Family Study. This study is essentially the precursor to TTFN, um, but I'm presenting it in the opposite order. Um, the TYFS sample included 20 families representing 54 family members. Family members were 80 to 97 percent white, um, and 38 percent of caregivers had a graduate degree, so pretty similar to um, the TTFN sample. This study included both transgender youth and cisgender caregivers and not siblings, so we added the siblings to TTFN later. Um, and the transgender youth represented uh, youth ages 7 to 18 years, so it was a more exploratory study, so we had a quite wide age range, and they represented um, gender identities across the spectrum. We also had primarily um, 
female cisgender caregivers in this study, and um, mostly mothers and one, one grandmother who, who participated. The study design of TYFS was two waves across one year, um, about six months apart. This was mixed method study as well with qualitative interviews and surveys with the transgender youth and caregivers. And it was also a multi-site study. So participants were recruited from support networks in Northeastern, Southern, and the Midwestern US. So we were able to look at a little bit of um, some differences by geographic location as well. So the research question that I want to talk about from this data specifically is how do transgender youth and caregivers describe their relationships within the family? To answer this question, we analyzed wave one qualitative interview data from the trans youth and caregivers, and we used immersion crystallization and thematic analysis approaches, um, which I'm happy to talk about more later if that's of interest. So we had three um, buckets of themes or larger categories of themes that we identified. One category was related to the youth caregiver relationship. One category was related to the caregiver-caregiver relationship in two-parent households. And then the third theme was related to these external sort of contextual factors that might be affecting what's happening in the family. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some, some sample quotes for all these themes um, to help us uh, understand what was going on here. So the first themes that I'm gonna talk about were specifically related to the youth caregiver relationship. And these themes were um, related to closeness between the youth and caregivers, um, movement toward acceptance, which I'll talk about a little bit more, and conflict. So the first theme that I wanna talk about was closeness. This was a theme across the majority of the interviews um, where you and, youth and caregivers alike both described the youth's gender identity development as a catalyst for closer relationships between the youth and caregiver and more communicative relationships. Um, some youth described differing levels of closeness with different caregivers. So this, this process of closeness may have looked different for, with caregivers and youth in the same family. So one 15-year-old um, trans boy from the southern US said, with my mom, I think it's gotten us a little closer because we have deeper conversations and we talk more. But with my dad, it's like there's a mini elephant in the room. Not like a huge one, but just a little one. The second thing that I want to talk about was movement to acceptance. Several caregivers, um, typically fathers in this case, often described an adjustment period after learning about their child's gender identity. This didn't necessarily mean that they weren't supportive later, and in fact, most of the people we talked to were supportive by the time they participated in the study, but many of them did describe um, having a harder time sort of getting to the point of acceptance um, from the beginning. So a father of a child who identified as a girlish boy, age eight years, from the northeastern US said, I think any parent would have to say there's some level of disappointment. I think you develop expe expectations of, this is what I want to do with my child. And again, there are stereotypical girl things, there are stereotypical boy things, and wanting to share, their, share those with your child. You have to find different things that you can share together. So there's an adjustment period there and probably a continuing adjustment. The next theme um, related to the youth caregiver uh, relationship was conflict. Participants often described conflict in this relationship arising in contexts in which the caregiver was attempting to police the youth's gender presentation. Um, for example, uh, having limiting the hair, hairstyles that they could have or the clothes that they could wear to express their gender, or it arose in, in times in which parents were restricting access to gender-affirming care for the youth. When caregivers failed to accept the youth's gender identity over time, it often caused critical roadblocks in the youth's ability to access some of these gender-affirming services. And one 18-year-old trans boy described this situation. People would ask me, oh, are you on testosterone? And I'd have to explain to them, no, my dad doesn't accept my gender identity and therefore didn't allow this youth to have access to gender affirming care. The, 
The second set of themes that I want to talk about were related to the caregiver-caregiver relationship in two-parent families. And these themes, which I'll talk about a little bit more, are proactivity between caregivers, discordance in parenting, and support. The first theme was proactivity between caregivers. In families in which the caregivers included mothers, both a mother and a father, mothers were often more proactive about accessing gender-affirming services for their child compared to fathers. Um, one mother of a 16-year-old trans boy explained, I'm still more proactive. I'm the one who did the name change, went to court, I took him for his social security card. So none of that would have been done had it been left to my husband. But again, to me, that's just kind of the man-woman thing. I don't know, I just take charge. <laughs> so this might be a situation similar to what other research has shown about, about mothers being more involved in helping their children access, access services or um, you know, scheduling medical appointments for the family, things like that. That also seems to be showing up here in transgender youth as well, in families with transgender youth. The second theme that I want to talk about is discordance in parenting. Differences in parenting often emerged when one caregiver was prepared to affirm the child's gender identity while the other caregiver was still adjusting to the identity disclosure. Um, this might look different in different situations. So sometimes um, parents were on the same page when a youth initially came out as transgender. Sometimes they were on completely different pages. Um, and, and that, that affected the family relationships overall. So a mother of a gender fluid nine-year-old boy talked about this discordance. At the time, my husband and I had very different ideas on how to raise a child like this. It was one opinion against another opinion, as easy as that. That became very troublesome for many different reasons. We weren't giving each other support because we didn't believe what the other one thought we should do. And so we were at constant odds about how to even address a child like this. This, has come up, this idea has come up a lot in my research, in both studies, and sometimes in some families it has led to separation of the parents or divorce in some cases because the family, the caregivers couldn't agree about how to raise this child. So on the flip side, I want to talk about um, a more positive theme that was also happening within caregivers, um, which was the theme of support. Caregivers often relied on each other for support, even though there was some discordance, um, especially when thinking about disclosing their child's gender identity to extended family members. So one mother of an eight-year-old trans girl described this. We would be going to see my family, and I would be freaking out. I'd get real stressed out and worried, like, what is this going to be like? How is this going to go? And that's where my husband would come and support me and help me through it and try to see my way through it. So now I want to talk about that third bucket of themes um, related to relationships that were contextual factors sort of coming from outside of the family. And these were related to school, extended family, and religion. So school often plays a critical role in family relationships, both in terms of offering support and challenges. And the slide that I showed you earlier with data from the GLSEN study showed us that transgender youth are having pretty negative experiences in school. So we might imagine how some of those are sort of coming home to the family to then affect what's happening in the family relationships as well, in the family environment. So one father of a trans boy age 18 years from the northeastern US said they, schools, were really, really supportive. And I think, you know, that helped a lot. Even in the first month or two, they just set the tone, I think. The mother of a trans girl age 11 from the Midwestern US said, we offered a lot of professionals to come to the school and offered things to other parents if they were curious. We offered things to the teachers, and our school was just absolutely not supportive in that. So in all of my research, we've really found quite a range in how schools respond to these families. Some schools do a really great job of being affirming, of educating their staff, um, of you know, supporting the youth however they can, and other schools are, are more resistant and families have to do a lot more work to advocate for their child. We've had a lot of families in my projects who have had to move to a different school district so that they can go to a more affirming school for their child. That's pretty common. 
So the second theme um, in this area of contextual factors was extended family. Relationships with extended family also played quite a big role in relationships within the immediate family. Um, families often talked about um, uh, the experience of going to the holidays or deciding not to go to the holidays because certain families were or were, were not supportive of their trans youth. So the mother, um, a mother of a girlish boy age eight years from the northeastern US, this is the same family that I quoted the father from earlier, she said, um, my dad said, I just don't understand. At what point are you going to make him play with gender appropriate toys? So I just lost it. And I said, this is who he is. This is what he likes to play with. And I'm not going to tell him that it's wrong. My husband said to me, I've never heard you yell at anyone like that. I've never seen you have a fight. It was the biggest fight of my life. So there's often a lot of conflict happening between immediate families and extended families in figuring out how to navigate and um, support the transgender youth in the family. Not to say that all extended families are not supportive because many of them are, but that's, that's kind of a theme that came up. And the last theme that I wanna talk about is religion. Um, several trans youth identified religion as an influence in their lives sometimes in, in a negative way with, with religious communities not being supportive and other times in a, mu in a much more supportive way. So um, one youth that was 17 um, talked about his, how his religious community provided support after socially transitioning. And he specifically recalled a positive experience at a weekend c conference that he went to with his faith community. He said, the kids that go to them, the weekend conferences, they kind of practice radical acceptance. Oh my gosh, you're different? That's the best thing ever. So I like to present this quote because I think there is this prevailing belief that religion um, is always negative toward transgender families or that the, the experiences with religion are all negative. And I think that that's not necessarily the case, that religious communities can also provide um, quite a bit of support for these youth. So some of the, the summarizing points from the trans youth family study, family relationships are quite complex with differing levels of closeness and conflict. Contextual factors happening outside of the family affect what's going on within the family. And the themes really highlight the importance of healthy relationships among family members for trans youth's well-being, both in terms of their own mental health, but also in terms of their ability to access gender affirming medical services. So what were some of the limitations of this research? Um, in TTFN, the families were only from New England. Um, the TYFS study didn't include siblings, although we were able to add siblings later in, in the TTFN project. Um, one of the big limitations of this research is that families were largely supportive. Um, in my experience, it is very hard to do research on trans youth and families with non-supportive families <laughs> because they don't want to participate in the research. <laughs> it's very hard to find them. It's hard to um, get people to trust you enough to tell you why they're not supportive. Um, so that's, that's definitely a limitation here. Although I would say that these families describe much complexity in what support looks like. The transgender youth and the families don't always perceive what the parents think is supportive as support. Many of the parents talk about not being supportive initially and then having to go on this sort of acceptance journey toward being supportive by the time we see them. So I think that there's still quite a bit to be learned um, from this research, even though on the, surface, on the surface it appears that it's just supportive families. And another limitation here is that this research um, is with families who are primarily white with higher caregiver education. So we know less about families of color, um, how uh, youth's gender identity and transition um, is affecting those families, what it might look like for low income families. So there's more work to be done certainly there. So now kind of moving on to the, the clinical implications piece with transgender youth and families. So revisiting the family you imagined at the beginning, how might these findings inform your work with this family or with families with transgender youth? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back to you all first before I tell you what I've come up with here. So how do, you, how do these findings resonate with you or how, how might they inform your clinical practice? And there's a mic that is coming around. Don't 
Don't be shy. Has anyone in here worked with a transgender youth before? A couple people are nodding. Yeah. Thank you. I did for an extremely short time. Um, I referred him to somebody who had more experience than I did. But obviously, I think that the more you tell them right off the bat, that the more supportive there are, the better everybody will do. The more supportive the family is. Right. Right. Yeah. The problem I had was I don't think one of the members of the family had any idea what support looked like. Yes. Yeah. So I think what support looks like means really different things to different family members. And parents don't always know how to be supportive or what, what that might mean in this situation for trans youth. Anyone else thinking about like how, how might I use this in my clinical practice or, or my research practice? So I'm already using the sort of need for support and the increased risk factors. I think the challenge I find with some families is a chicken and an egg problem where these kids had mental health challenges before they were presenting with gender stuff. So the parent is confused about what is what and thinks sometimes that the mental health challenges are driving the gender versus the other way around. And um, and it isn't so clear, and it is probably a both and, yes. though I do think there's a lot of, well, if his depression gets better, this will go away, or that, you know, or whatever, or that this is a product of his social isolation due to his social anxiety, and not, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of that, I feel like, with families who are trying to be supportive, but are also trying to pull apart the layers of what's going on with their kid, and, um, and it does become a bit of a chicken and egg argument about which came first, and what is driving what in terms of the mental health piece with these kids? Yeah, so it's really complex, and I think, I think you're right that the families in many cases are just trying to make sense of what's going on, and figuring out how to support their child in the midst of that can be tricky when they don't necessarily know, is this mental health concern actually mean that my child is trans or not? It, it's, it's definitely tricky. Other people's perspectives, yes. Uh, to look for the resources and supports that there are out there for them and to become knowledgeable. And there are a number of groups that, not from this presentation, but from other ways that I've learned that are there for families uh, to, to find support and with other families so that they can, you know, peer to peer, you know, um, kind of sort things out and get that kind of support and uh, feel like a uh, sense of somebody else knowing what they're going through. Yes. And, and, and what is, you know, to sort out what issues are, what is normal, what's coming from other issues. Yeah, abs everybody needs that. Absolutely. I think the, the parents in my research have um, talked a lot about the benefits of support groups for parents, whether those are in-person support groups or online support groups. And the, this, this is also true for the kids, but being around other families who have similar experiences is really critical for these families to know, um, is this unique to my child? How have you handled this aspect of the school system? How have you at, handled this aspect of extended families? Being able to talk with families with similar experiences is really critical. Um, we are lucky to be in a very resource-rich environment here in Massachusetts and in New England in general, but especially in Massachusetts. There are many, many resources for transgender youth and families, many support groups, um, pretty easy access to gender-affirming services here. So uh, the families have a lot of options here, luckily, that might not exist for families elsewhere in the country. Yes. I'll, I'll go. Um, Thank you. And, and, you know, so my, my comment question is a complicated one. And it, it goes back to this chicken and egg thing. And I think there's no doubt in anyone's mind that if you are in a sexual or gender identity minority and you are living in, a, in an environment that's hostile toward 
who you are intrinsically and you know you can't change it. You've tried, you tried, and you can't change it. Um, there's, I think there's no doubt in most people's minds that that can lead to depression and anxiety. The conundrum, I think, is that, you know, your data suggests that the, the, the individual trans kids, their perception of acceptance or rejection was actually much more meaningfully related to depression, self-injury, suicidality than objective other people, whether we call them objective or not, but outside, outside, outside people's perception didn't really align with that. And, and when I see something like that, you know, I put my clinician hat on as a psychiatrist, and when I see people with clinical depression, regardless of what causes their clinical depression, so they might have a trauma history, they might actually have hypothyroidism. They might actually have Cushing's disease. Clearly, they're de they might have post, you know, um, postpartum depression. Those people's depression is clearly related to a hormonal imbalance, not necessarily environmental rejection. Yet when people are clinically depressed, they feel alone, isolated. They feel rejected. They feel like my life doesn't have much meaning anymore. Nobody really understands me. Nobody really accepts me. Maybe I should even kill myself. They won't really care. They really, it doesn't really matter because I'm nothing. And that's what the phenomenon of depression does to people. So when I look at your data, I almost wonder the trans youth, if I wonder for some of them if th the phenomenon of major depression might be influencing their perception of whether their family and others accept them or not. And, and if that's the case, the primary intervention may need to be aggressive treatment for their depression. I'm not necessarily saying that has to be medication. It could be psychotherapy, it could be cognitive, you know, attacking the cognitive distortions that they might have about how they're going to fit into society, but it might include depression, it might include hormonal treatments, it might include a lot of things. But, um, but it's, a, it's a real conundrum, because when I work with clinically depressed people, regardless of the cause, if they come to me and say, you know, my problem is my boss at work, and if my boss doesn't, you know, go lighter on me, my life is never going to be better. Sometimes I see that the real cause is their clinical depression. I give them an antidepressant. They get better a month later, and then their boss is somehow tolerable. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't the boss, and I didn't, need to, I didn't need to change the situation at work. I just needed to change their depression. That's a really interesting question. I think what, what is missing for me as I hear you talk is the piece about is the family, does the youth feel that they need to, that they want to express their gender or have their gender be affirmed differently from their sex assigned at birth, and is the family letting them do that? Because I think what, one of the treatments often for, for mental health issues in transgender youth is to allow them to affirm their gender. And sometimes that resolves the mental health concerns. Sometimes it doesn't, in which case there's something else underlying happening, right? So I would say in that situation, like, I, I would want to know more in these situations about what, what is the family doing to affirm the youth's gender? And, and does that help address their, their um, depression or not? And, and I wonder if, if when families do affirm the gender and, in, and that does affect their mental health, whether that changes the perception of, their, of what's happening in the family. I think that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering about the um, the relation or the the relative impact of family support and peer support. Now I don't know if you've had a chance to get into you know through the qualitative work some of the like comments around you know friends 
because I do think there's a generational shift happening around acceptance and support of gender minority youth. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, young people could get, you know, strong peer support, even if their family's not supportive, and how those, you know, potentially relate to each other in the young people's um, feeling supported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't, so we definitely ask about, um, about peer support in, in TTFN. We haven't been able to analyze that, that data yet. But my sense from, from looking at the data um, without doing a, a complete analysis is that the youth describe a, a pretty wide range of peer experiences. Because we have this other data that the youth are experiencing a lot of discrimination at school. But I think the youth that do have peers um, that are supportive do draw a lot of support and that can sometimes help balance out support that's not from the family. But the kids are still, unless they're homeless or living somewhere else, are still going home to the family at night, right? So even though they might have supportive peers, it might not be enough to completely, um, completely be protective for them without also having family support. Um, so I'll, I'll share some of the implications uh, that I came up with with all of you, and then I'm, I'm happy to answer other, other questions that you have. Um, my screen turned off, so I'm just going to turn around <laughs> so that I can see what it says. Um, okay, so some of the implications for practice that I came up with are that transgender youth's perception of family functioning is really has the greatest impact on their mental health. So the way this might translate into clinical practice is um, that the whole family really needs to be involved in um, supporting the family, or in, in supporting the transgender youth, or treating the transgender youth, while still recognizing that the trans youth's own perception is the most important and should be prioritized. Um, another implication for practice is that transgender youth's identity development and gender transition really affects the entire family. Um, so this might mean that all the family members need support, not just the transgender youth, not just the caregivers. A lot of um, the research that we've done with the siblings in TTFN suggests that the siblings often feel left out of this process entirely, that the whole family is going to therapy except for the sibling. Um, so the siblings, all the family members might need support. Since family members have different perceptions of what's going on in the family, different perceptions of what support looks like, different family members um, might need different types of support. Um, so uh, supporting, supporting each family member might look a little bit different. And this research also has implications in terms of the contextual factors that are affecting the trans youth and families. Um, and one of the implications that's easier <laughs> to be able to look in front of me. Um, so we really need to be educating people about transgender youth and families, which I'm hoping me being here today is a piece of that. Um, and also we can be doing work to advocate for trans, trans youth and families in schools, as well as in local, state, and federal policies as well. I wanted to talk very briefly about a couple of the other projects that I'm working on related to trans youth and families. Um, one is a study using Delphi methodology, um, which I can talk about a little bit more, um, to develop parenting guidelines for parents of gender nonconforming children. And also as part of TTFN, we are working on developing an intervention for families with transgender youth. Um, both of these studies are recruiting, so a quick plug for recruitment. Um, we're recruiting for the Delphi study transgender people ages 16 plus, as well as professionals um, who have uh, expertise in families with trans youth. Um, we, I have a contact info, but please come up and talk to me if you're interested in participating. We are also recruiting for focus groups for um, the TTFN digital storytelling project, which is to develop the intervention that I mentioned. And we're recruiting trans teens, um, caregivers of trans teens, siblings of trans teens, as well as mental health providers who work with families with transgender youth. I want to acknowledge um, our funding sources and the many, many people who have been involved in this research in an advisory role and a participatory role. And I'm happy to answer other questions in our last few minutes.
looks like some folks need to leave. So for people who are remaining, <laughs> uh, do you have any questions that I can answer? Is there any data on uh, people who think they're trans when they're younger and change their mind when they're older? So certainly I would say that gender can be fluid for some people. Um, some people might, and also timing of gender identity development is really different across people. So people who are transgender might recognize their gender identity in childhood. They might recognize it as an adolescent or later on as an adult. Um, some people might experience changes in terms of um, how masculine or feminine they feel. Maybe someone comes out at one point as a transgender man and then later they realize that they're more non-binary. So gender can be a little bit fluid. I would say it's, in my experience and in the research, much less common for someone to come out as a child as transgender very strongly as this is my identity and to change their mind later. Certainly it's possible that it happens, but it doesn't happen um, very often. Other questions? One more thing. The 18-year-old who said his father didn't accept his, uh, is, isn't he old enough to make a decision on his own at 18? Yes, I think that this participant in particular um, was talking about previous a previous, ex sorry, previous experience in which um, his father wasn't supportive and he wasn't able to access treatment. But you're right that that at the time of this interview, he would have been able to access treatment. Is there any yeah. data on d delaying it too long? The risk of delaying it too long is that gender-affirming medical treatment can help a person be recognized as their affirmed gender by other people because it changes their secondary sex characteristics. So the risk of waiting longer is that especially for adolescents who are still going through puberty and developing their secondary sex characteristics, it will be harder for them to be recognized as their affirmed gender if they take hormones later versus younger. And I'm wondering about the effect on the brain. That is a big question. And the subject of potential research in this area, we don't know very much at all about effects on the brain. That's, that's an area that needs to be done for sure. Um, I work in research, and my experience working with transgender youth was working with transgender youth who were also in foster care. Um, and so kind of related to somebody's earlier question about peer support, I'm wondering kind of where the point is on uh, letting go of the like maybe false hope that original families are going to provide the necessary support to keep someone alive. Um, and moving forward into believing in chosen families um, and kind of along with that the idea that you know when is forcing these original families to provide support actually just providing them like education over holding care for the individual youth when is that priority kind of getting skewed yeah great question um, so so to your first question I would say yes chosen family are critical and s sometimes families of origin are just not going to be supportive ever. What becomes tricky with children who are under age 18, children and adolescents, is that if they want gender-affirming medical treatment, they can't get it without their parents' permission, unless they can get a court order in some states. So there does need to be some level, some effort, I think, to, to get families on board um, to allow their children to have gender-affirming treatments, if possible. Um, and that, that Support can happen often through educating families. I think a lot of the families who are not supportive just don't really understand what's going on and it feels very confusing and scary to them. And it isn't necessarily the case that they don't love their child or want to support their child, but they just don't really understand the experience that their child is having. So I think that education is really critical um, and can help bring people around, as well as also connecting parents to other um, families that are going through similar situations and hearing other parents talk about their own um, cognitive processes around understanding their child's experience. Yeah. Other questions? Seeing none, let's have one last round of applause for Dr. Katzweiss. Thank you so much.